Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts, a free educational netcast bringing geology to all. Change is hard. Change can be stressful. Life experience, strain, will take their toll and render a permanent change in a person. The heat and the pressure of an emotional strain can transform us into completely different people. And the same is true of geologic materials like rocks. Under extreme pressure and extreme heat, they can transform. Their original material remaining essentially present and intact, but under extreme pressure and heat inside the earth, the minerals within can be transformed into completely different forms. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this episode. Metamorphism. Hello. Geologic metamorphism is the process by which rocks are transformed by pressures and temperatures that force the minerals in a rock to recrystallize. In Earth Parts episode number 27, I introduced the concepts of the rock cycle and of metamorphism, along with regional metamorphism and thermal or contact, where regional metamorphism occurs under mountain ranges where, for example, Two continental plates are grinding together to form a mountain range like the Himalayan mountain. In that case, metamorphism changes rock across a linear band of territory that forms the core complex of those mountain ranges. I also talked about thermal and contact metamorphism that happen when rock is exposed to high temperature igneous intrusion, heat, for example. If you need to go back and watch that part, it would probably help. But I'm going to build on that and talk about metamorphic rocks, their textures, their types, and how you can identify them. The two most important variables concerning metamorphism are pressure and temperature. As rock is buried geologically, it will get hotter and be under more confining pressure. If you go down about eight kilometers or about five miles in the crust, for example, beneath your feet, the temperatures are up around 150 to 200 Celsius, and the confining pressures are in thousands of atmospheres, or what we call kilobars. As rock is further buried in the crust, it goes to higher temperatures and higher pressures, and so metamorphism isn't one set of things that happen to a rock. It's the result of a wide range of pressure and temperature conditions that a rock can undergo before it is then later uplifted and we find it. So metamorphism can be graded as low grade, medium to high grade metamorphism. And roughly as you go at higher grades of metamorphism, you're going to higher pressures and temperatures that the rock was subjected to completely recrystallizing and regrowing the minerals within. Another source of pressure can be differential stress. That is, during a mountain building event where two continents are crushed together, the driving pressure might be very directional as a result of those two plates directly colliding, but the depth may not be that great. So pressures within the core of a building mountain range are much higher than they would be simply at that depth otherwise. Differential stress can force the minerals that are growing in a metamorphic rock during metamorphism and force them to grow in particular directions, such as perpendicular to the direction of crushing force directionally applied to rock during a tectonic event. Recrystallization of minerals during metamorphism is also assisted by the presence of fluids that are often in the rock. When sedimentary rock is buried, it can still contain a fair bit of water. Other rocks can contain water as well, or hydrated minerals. So as they get buried during metamorphism, that water is driven out of the rock and it can also be hot and carry with it dissolved mineral components. Rare elements can be mobilized from rock and deposit somewhere else. Quartz veins in a rock, gold seam, deposits of gem quality crystals. These are usually the result of fluids moving in a rock during metamorphism and then as they may move out of the region of high pressure or high temperature they crystallize out and leave spectacular deposits behind. Because confinement pressure and differential stress can force metamorphosing rock to essentially flatten and force the mineral grains to grow perpendicular to the direction of the stress. Progressively higher grades of metamorphic rock tend to show what we call foliation. Foliation is a term applied only to metamorphic rock. It's because metamorphic rocks show layering that may not be layering. When you look at a sedimentary rock, you're looking at the layers of sediment that built up over time and were compacted down during normal rock forming Buried. Later, if the rock becomes buried further and goes through metamorphism, it can be flattened still and you can see the banding in the rock as a fossil, if you will, of the original sedimentary layering. But rock that goes to extremely high grades of metamorphism can be unrecognizable as what it even started out as, as a parent rock. 
And so the layering in extremely high grade of metamorphism may simply be due to differential stress forcing the rock to layer out as it flattens. And so we use the different term. And we can divide up metamorphic rocks in terms of identification into foliated and non-foliated rocks, which helps us to understand what they are in hand sample or in the field. Let's talk about the most common types of metamorphic rocks you're likely to encounter. And we're going to start with something that's not metamorphosed. I want to start with shale. Shale is a sedimentary rock, but it is often the parent rock of a lot of metamorphic rocks, simply because it's a common form of sedimentary rock to begin with. When it's buried, it'll get metamorphosed. Under progressively higher temperatures and pressures, you can convert shale into a rock type that we call slate. Slate is different from shale because it's been through metamorphism, but they look very similar in hand sample. Shale tends to form in flat line layers, or thin plates. It's a very fine grained sedimentary material. If you take that and crush it under pressure for a long time at high temperatures, we're talking probably a couple of hundred Celsius and maybe two or three kilobars, plus or minus. But under those conditions, you will drive out the water, you'll force the grains together, all the thin mica grains are gonna line up and they're gonna lock right to each other, and you're gonna form a rock that looks like shale, but it's a lot tougher. It tends to break along planes, just like shale would, but it doesn't crumble very easily. It's a harder rock. It's slate, and because it breaks into plates and it's fairly easy to cut into different shapes that are flat, uh, it's been used for roofing shingles for centuries. It's good for that, and the shingles made of rock tend to last for a while. If you take slate and metamorphose it further, going up to a medium grade of metamorphism, you can change the rock into what we call a phyllite, which is essentially similar to a slate, but with a lot more obvious mica in it. The mica tends to be very reflective and handsome, and phyllite tends to be very mica-rich, because at that grade of metamorphism, a lot of the clay minerals that were in the sedimentary rock to begin with are recrystallizing into other minerals. The metamorphic grade of phyllite, mica tends to be a dominant product of that recrystallization process, starting with clays, turning into muscovite, chlorite, mica. Higher grade than phyllite is schist. A schist is what you get when you take something like a shale, metamorphose it through to slate, and then further to higher pressures and temperatures where even the slaty layers recrystallize together more strongly. And so schist will cleave in platy directions, but typically it won't break into thin plates very much. It's tougher than that. It also will often show kind of a wavy pattern imposed by pressure. At the metamorphic grade of schist, you have a heavily transformed rock. The original material is still mostly there, but it's now in different minerals. And you can see some spectacular minerals at this sort of medium grade of metamorphism. Garnets, a lot of minerals that we think of as gem quality, uh, take some fairly high grades of metamorphism to, to grow. At the highest grade of metamorphism for something like this rock type that we started as a shale, going through slate, phyllite, schist, and then finally you get to gneiss. Gneiss is a very high grade of metamorphism. Gneiss is typically foliated. It's strongly foliated, but that may not be the original layers. It may simply be because of differential stress. Gneiss tends to be hard, difficult to break because it's so dense and made of such finely intergrown crystals. Gneiss tends to have the appearance of being banded in black and white, where the whitish layers are more quartz rich and the black layers are typically biotite mica. Because it's a strong rock, gneiss is used all over the place for building material. Because it's very tough, stands up to punishment, and it's actually tougher and denser than something like granite. At the highest grades of metamorphism, just on the cusp of becoming igneous rock, you find migmatites. Migmatites are essentially a very high grade form of gneiss, which at one point reached temperatures where some of the minerals were beginning to melt, but they never went anywhere, they never moved. There wasn't enough melt to collect together to flow out of the rock. And so it simply recrystallizes back to solid as temperature goes back down. And now for something completely different. If you want to think about non-foliated metamorphic rocks, there's a couple of major types that you're going to run into. The most common, of course, being quartzite and marble. These are classic building materials that humans have used for centuries. Quartzite is metamorphosed sandstone. If you take sandstone and compress it, during a metamorphism event. The quartz grains will essentially be pushed harder together, compacted, and the grains will recrystallize to grow together. And they do so at the millimeter scale. So quartzite is 
one of the toughest of metamorphic rocks. Quartz has a hardness of seven already, and so you take a sedimentary rock made of quartz grains and you forge it to one mass of intergrown crystals. Another kind of metamorphic rock that's commonly encountered is marble. Marble is metamorphosed limestone. Limestone rock, when you metamorphose it, it also recrystallizes like quartz grains turning into quartzite. But in the case of limestone, crystals of calcium carbonate grow together, form a tough rock without foliation and without layering or banding that makes really good statuary material because it's not particularly hard. It's Remember, it's calcium carbonate, not quartz. So its hardness is much less, and it's much more easy to work and to chisel. The crushing pressures that can convert limestone into marble also destroy whatever fossils were there. If the limestone began full of fossils, it will not end that way as marble. Those fossils will be erased as the texture of the rock is completely reconstructed. Another kind of metamorphic rock that you may not think of as metamorphic rock is anthracite coal. I'll talk about coal and its grades in a different episode. But for now, I want to mention it because it is a kind of low-grade metamorphic rock. Coal is compressed vegetation matter, dead plant biomass on land, sphagnum peat, woody material, compacted down, the water is driven out, and it is converted into essentially black carbon, which we find useful. But if that coal remains in the sedimentary rock, as it is itself going through low-grade metamorphism, in which limestone can become marble and sandstone can become quartzite, coal will also become something else. Coal becomes anthracite coal. Most of the impurities are driven out, including sulfur, Meaning anthracite coal is valuable because it contains a high energy density and not a lot of pollutants. So the highest grade of coal is itself a kind of metamorphic rock. If anthracite coal is taken from low grade metamorphism up to high grade metamorphism, such as in a gneiss, then it tends to reduce even further down from anthracite coal to graphite, black carbon graphite, the same that you would use in a pencil lead. And in fact, the earliest geochemical evidence for life on Earth comes from layers of ancient graphite in Archean-aged gneiss found in northern Canada and in Greenland. The rock has been through high-grade metamorphism. All potential possibility of even bacterial microfossils is erased, but the carbon is still there and its isotopic ratios give us evidence that life was here on Earth as bacterial biofilms in the sea as early as 3.85 billion years ago. Metamorphic rocks give us information about the earliest episodes of life on this planet.